uh, earlier, I was talking to uh, Mike earlier today or emailing him. I was out on a uh, bike ride and uh, Mike said, well, we'll start up at uh, oh, 05 o'clock, 1700, we'll, we'll do a test run. And it finally occurred, it just occurred to me at that point that I didn't know what 1700 he meant. I mean, I mentioned to Mike that it reminded me of a true horror story. Uh, back in about 91 or so, I, uh, I was tasked to lead a four ship of F-111s over, uh, I think it was Greenham Common. You know, they had an Air Force installation there. No airplanes, but an installation. And they wanted a flyby, four ship flyby for uh, POW MIA day. So I, uh, we uh, did extensive arrangements with the with Greenham to find out, you know, exactly what time, run in, you know, how to do the missing man, and we're gonna we went out and practiced it, and it went fine. Um, fortunately, uh, as it later turned out, I kept a very detailed record of all my discussions with the Greenham Common Command Post. Because when it came to the real POW MIA day, uh, we took off on time, went out to uh, Wayne Fleet Range, was out, uh, on, if for those who live in England, it's out in East Anglia, near RAF Coningsby. Uh, <clears throat> half hour on the range, and then we're gonna go back across England, go into a hold and wait uh, for time to show up. Halfway back, halfway over to Greenham Common, uh, uh, London Mill calls and says, uh, "Hey, you guys, you just need to uh, you need to return to base right now." And that I knew that wasn't a good thing. Well, it turned out that uh, we always do in in, uh, in the flying business. We always do everything on Zulu time, and the base PA people did things on local time and the uh, command post never at, at Greenham never solved that problem, never identified that problem. So we were uh, an hour late for POW MIA day uh, because they didn't know which time 10 a.m. was. So we got that straight, you know, this, it's a big deal in England and during uh, summertime. And so <laughs> it's a good thing that Mike and I got it straight uh, because I would have been there an hour early because I would have been there <laughs> on my turn, which is, is Central European time, which is an hour ahead of England, even though England's almost due north of Germany. So why that is, I don't know, but uh, it's a good thing we got it sorted out. Um, so anyway, thanks. Uh, I, I, it's a real pleasure to be welcomed back again. It's uh, great to be back, and I'm glad Mike asked. Uh, and I hope I can either provide uh, value for the question, or that you'll, if I answer in bollocks, you'll uh, you'll yank me up short and set me straight. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I, and I'm also trying to figure out how to learn learn how to use this uh, screen the question queue, so I'm not scanning past a whole bunch of people. So if I do that, I'm a, it's a incompetence on my part. <clears throat> um, Mark Hungwell, oh God, I wish that was my name. My wife never calls me that, uh, <laughs> asks about a real top speed number for the F-111. And the book answer is Mach 2.5. Uh, the F-111A and E, actually, they're they both about the same engines. The 111A was actually a little faster because the intakes, uh, on account of reasons, were closer to the fuselage, and so it was a little bit uh, less drag at high speed. The fastest I ever had it was about 1.9 or 2.0, up at about 42,000 feet. That was during fighter weapons school, and we just went up to do a a kind of an advanced handling exercise for a sortie. And I was really astonished that the airplane has still had it at Mach 2, it still had considerable shove. And the airplane turned really well. That that supersonic high altitude environment really suited it. And it was I was easily pulling three, three and a half G's at uh, 
at 42,000 feet without losing a knot, uh, which I really didn't expect. The uh, F-111F and the D had more powerful engines. And I had it on pretty good authority that an F-111D got up to Mach 3 uh, on a uh, functional check flight run. And the F-111F was even faster. Um, we didn't have really a, there was not an airframe limit. Uh, because the wing sweep at 72 degrees was so far aft that the uh, the span, what we call spanwise airflow, the flow that uh, went sideways as the wing hit it, meant that the uh, wing never really went supersonic. So the the airplane was really limited in top speed by thrust and temperature. And we had a temperature gauge in the airplane that would give us a countdown. If it, if it went above a certain temperature, I can't remember what it was, just a couple hundred degrees Fahrenheit maybe, uh, where the temperature sensor was. It started a countdown, and we had to, we had to slow down if that countdown timer went to zero. Uh, practically speaking, since we were never a high-altitude supersonic roll, we never really uh, needed that. And at Red Flag, uh, you're – you're using so much gas so quickly when you're going supersonic, you just can't be supersonic long enough to round the counter down to zero. Anyway, to make that very long uh, answer shorter, uh, two and a half Mach 2.5 was the number in the flight manual. I think the, uh, the F-111D and the F-111F could take it up to Mach 2.0. And at low altitude, we were hitting the barber pole. That's because the air is thicker down there. We were, we were starting to hit a limit. Uh, right about Mach 1.2. Um, and then at the fastest I went, I think I saw 963 knots in an F-111D uh, on the deck. And that number was helped probably we, we were heading eastbound. I think it was about a 20-knot wind out of the west. And uh, it was a, um, a warmer than average day for that time of year. So we were going faster for the same Mach. Uh, anyway, that's those. That's the answer to the speed question, as far as I know it. Um, freckle, uh, freck the freckle puny. That's a cool name. How does the F one eleven compare to the Russian Su twenty four? And was there much? Uh, well, I'll answer that question first. I don't have. A very good answer for that. The Su-24 was really a 111 lookalike. Uh, it was a, it's a smaller airplane. Uh, I don't think it had. Um, I think all its stores were carried on the fuselage. I don't think it had pivoting uh, wing uh, pylons like the F-111 did. So its stores were limited. It was shorter range. Uh, it wasn't as fast, and. Uh, the uh, radar was smaller. The, the airplane overall, I think, is about 15 or 20 percent smaller than the F-111 using comparable, well, I say comparable, it's contemporaneous, nearly contemporaneous technology, which means uh, in terms of electronics, it's probably far more uh, primitive than the F-111. Uh, and uh, so I think it probably didn't have as much capability in the low altitude uh, just in the ground attack role because his radar wasn't as good. As far as rivalry with the, uh, he asked uh, also if there was much rivalry with the uh, Navy's A6 intruder units. Not that I ever really dealt with. There, we didn't work with the Navy very much. Um, we, uh, we did get tasks sometimes to uh, practice being red air attacking the fleet. But uh, in, in Desert Storm, uh, we we were stationed in Turkey, or the, my unit was stationed in Turkey, and the Navy was down in the Gulf, uh, in the Persian Gulf, and they were pretty much in the southern half of of uh, Iraq. So we never really worked with it. We didn't coordinate with the Navy at all. We had a kind of a fence where they uh, took northern bag. Dad and South, and we were Al Taji, which is the, their big airfield um, uh, just north of northern Baghdad. And we, we dealt with Al Taji in north. So that, that was a way we kind of de uh, made the coordination less 
incredibly complex than it already was. We, uh, I was a mission planner, one of the lead mission planners for um, the Inzulik operation. We spent a lot of time coordinating with uh, B-52s. They had B-52s coming from uh, Fairford, England. And so we had to coordinate with them. Plus, we coordinated with all the organic assets that we had in Inzulik because we had a full-up uh, multi-mission wing an expeditionary wing, whereas all the other units down in Saudi were, all the other bases were basically single airframe kind of operations. So they didn't, uh, we almost ran a red flag, very similar red flag up there. And, and all the lessons we kind of, the way you approached a red flag worked really pretty well with Angelic. But because of that, uh, we never really worked with the A6 intruder units. What I remember of the A6 is that it would do terrain following, but its minimum altitude was a thousand feet. It um, and it, uh, I think it topped out about four hundred fifty knots. So we never, we wouldn't even get out of bed unless it involved going faster than four eighty. And uh, during Desert Storm, we were five fifty to six thirty. So when you're when you're talking about hundred knot speed differentials, it gets really hard to coordinate with that A6, but we never really had any, uh, uh, as far as I know, rivalry because we just never really worked with them. Um, George TSR2 asks, how do I think the 111 would have coped with SAM systems in the late 80s? Uh, the, I think that was about when the SA6 had been... That was probably an eight or 10 year old system by the uh, mid 80s, uh, by the late 80s. And um, that one, that one might have stung us a little bit. The, the, what we were hoping for was our multi layered approach to suppression of enemy air defenses meant that we, um, we weren't alone there that, that with harms, uh, with wild weasels and harms, that they could keep the radars from operating, just turning the radar on and looking at stuff uh, without having to worry about getting schwacked. And then we are altitude or low altitude and high speed uh, would mean that their acquisition time would be so limited that uh, they'd have a hard time shooting us anyway. And on top of that, we had some EW systems. It gave us some uh, jamming capability. So I think we would have been okay through about the uh, end of the mid 80s. But the SA-10 and SA-12 were coming online right about the end of the Cold War. And I think that's what drove the, uh, the 111 out of the inventory. Um, partly it was high maintenance. 35 man hours per flight hours. That's, you know, there are some women out there that are high maintenance, I've heard, uh, but man, 111 beats them all. Um, so part of it was that. It was an expensive system to run. Uh, the other part was uh, the F-15E came along. And it wasn't, the F-15E didn't have quite the performance or the payload or the range or the tactical flexibility of the F-111. Uh, the F-111F had a lot of tactical flexibility because the paved tack pod was mounted in the center of the bottom of the fuselage. So when you're using a, when you're tossing a gravity weapon, uh, no matter what, no matter which direction you turn off target, you can point the uh, laser at the target. Whereas the uh, F-15E had, because they had to put the paved tack, uh, um, pot on one side of the airplane or the other, they had what I think they called the podium effect, which are you couldn't turn certain directions off target because if you did, the, the laser would get blanked by the fuselage. So they were a little more limited to tactical flexibility and some other limitations that the F-111 did have, but the overall reliability and uh, uh, maintenance demands of the airplane, that kind of meant the F F-111 was on its way out in any event. And then with the advent of stealth, uh, basically the whole game's changed that I don't think anybody save for close air support like A-10. If you're supporting troops in contact, I uh, think only the A-10 
really goes low altitude anymore because uh, it's just uh, with the uh, precision guided weapons and self guided weapons, it just makes sense to stay the heck out of the threat envelope. And the F 111 just isn't, you don't need an F 111 to do that anymore. Uh, John Ellis asks if I have a watch with multiple time zones. Now, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not a paid shill for, for uh, Citizen. This, I'm holding this up to the camera here. This is the best watch for aviators in the world. Uh, it's a Citizen Navahawk. And um, it has like all the time zones in the world. It is set, it sets itself to uh, some radio stations in Europe and the United States and Japan that broadcast a, a on the money atomically calibrated time signal. It glows in the dark. It has countdown timer, circular slide rule. Anyway, um, so I, that's how I keep track of multiple time zones. I, I just, it's a, button change and I can, you know, one button swap and I'm into my new time zone. And it's really, really handy in my, uh, my job is flying, you know, freight all over the place. Um, <laughs> Jody, that's a great question. Um, how did you read the total temp indicator when it was uh, mounted above and behind the Wizzo's shoulder? Uh, your understanding of the total temp indicator used to indicate the time at heat levels that you, where you had to slow down. And that's a very perceptive question because there, I don't think there was any warning light uh, on the, uh, on the ca warning and caution panel. And basically, I don't think anybody ever looked at it ever. And it was probably stuck there because it fulfilled the requirement and nobody cared enough to really do anything about it. So um, uh, uh, there was, you know, paragraphs in the flight manual about what it meant. And I'm certain that other than knowing where it was, I never looked at it my entire 13 years in the airplane. Um, Aaron Freyer asks, uh, or say, uh, says he recently went solo after starting my primary training in a Super Cub. Congratulations. That is a big day. Um, I remember going solo for the first time, both in a, it was a Piper Arrow. That was so long ago. Uh, very first time solo, and then my first time solo in a, a T-37 in the Air Force. Both of those days are burned into my brain. Oh, they're, they're something you just never forget. And then he asks, um, any advice for someone looking to get into aerobatics and formation flying? Uh, I'd have to say if you're, if you're, I'll talk about formation flying first because I, um, you have, you have to be the, the biggest chunk of advice is you have to be flying with people who are extremely disciplined, uh, that, and that you, when you're going to go out and fly formation, you, uh, get it straight completely what your signals are going to be, radio calls are going to be, what position you're going to be flying. Uh, and it's the sort of thing you kind of got to, all the air, um, and then you also have to know what the visual references are for the position you're flying. Uh, like I think even now I know it, I think in fingertip in the, uh, T-37, which had a three-foot wing overlap, and then in the Air Force, flew, we flew pretty aggressive formation in pilot training. I was uh, sighting along the front end corner of the wingtip onto the O of U.S. Air Force, which is painted on both sides of the uh, fuselage and the nose, and that got my angle. And then I think I sighted down the trailing edge of the horizontal stabilizer. And if I was looking down the trailing edge of the horizontal stabilizer and nailing the O in Air Force, then I was in position. And then the trick is, is that is to the sooner, it's just like, in fact, this is just like instrument flying. When you get to instrument flying, uh, the sooner you catch a deviation, the 
smaller your correction has to be or needs to be. And if you are doing, if you're rapidly catching deviations and making small corrections, it all looks very smooth. And it's a world of difference uh, compared to uh, catching deviations when they get larger. So the one advice for being formation is uh, you got to be really just ruthlessly uh, aggressive about being in position and fixing uh, the deviations when they're really small. As for aerobatics, uh, we uh, the my only aerobatics experience is in pilot training primarily, and primarily in the T thirty seven and T thirty four. The, the F one eleven would it would do a loop. Uh, the Australians did them all the time, but in the U.S. Air Force, uh, we weren't allowed to do loops. Uh, so we would do uh, Sean, not Sean Dell's, uh, what do you call it, where you do a half a loop and roll out at the top. Uh, maybe that's, anyway, that was legal. Uh, barrel rolls, aileron rolls. But we didn't um, do aerobatics in the sense of spins or, or a lot of the other um, stuff that you see in air shows with, with smaller airplanes. Uh, and the big difference is that Almost no fighter that I know of, uh, if you put it into a spin, your odds are getting it out are really, really low. Whereas uh, like a Super Cub or almost any of uh, the T-34, um, T-37, you put that into a spin, you, if you do a recovery right, you're going to get it out within a turn. And if you blow it, unless you like comprehensively blow it, you're going to get it out in three. Um, so. Most of my aerobatics experience was with, um, uh, I think the most meaningful part was with a T-34. That's the uh, turboprop powered, uh, it's a Bonanza, Beechcraft Bonanza with uh, reconfigured for inline seating. And there you really have to um, kind of, I don't know if you've ever seen air show pilots, so like they'll walk around and They'll kind of rehearse, or, or uh, they'll rehearse the show just by walking through it and and using and um, mimicking the maneuver with their hands. Uh, I used to teach students. I used to say this is all about a whole lot of this stuff is about um, imagining a nose track in the air. So I'd, I'd get a pointer like you use on a on a whiteboard or a blackboard. So okay, here's your pointer. If you're going to do a lazy eight which is really not an easy maneuver to do, here's you have to how you imagine the nose track to be. And so I'm, I'm, I want my nose track to come up to 45 degrees nose high and at 45 degrees a turn, which is over here, 45 degrees above the horizon, 45 degrees a bank. So I have to imagine this nose track as I'm, and I'm flying my airplane in, all the time to make me hit that point. Then as I come to the 90 degree point, I want the, the airplane to be at 90 degrees of bank, nose on the horizon, and have done 90 degrees of turn. And then I could talk through the rest of it. But you really have to, for any aerobatics, you really have to have walked through and thought through how you want it, exactly what the airplane, and what you want the airplane to do. Because invariably, when you do a barrel roll for the first time, you're going to end up 20 degrees nose low which isn't where you want it. And then, then the next thing you have to do, and you should have recognized that happening because it's not matching your nose track. And then, and then you also have to have thought really hard about unusual attitude recoveries. Because if you get nose low on a barrel roll, and if you continue it, you're just going to bury the nose, you're going to lose a crap ton of altitude. Uh, whereas the re proper response is, this didn't turn out the way I wanted, and I'm not going to do no nose low unusual attitude recovery, which is unload roll to the nearest horizon, and then pull to the horizon. Um, so I, I hope I didn't belabor that too much. But that's it's really to do that stuff properly. It requires a lot of discipline and a lot of really thinking about it before you do it. And hopefully having uh, other pilots around who have a lot of experience and are people you would trust with your life. John Ellis asks, did I hear about the Australian plan to put FY19 engines 
in the F11G? Um, no, I did not. Um, the I think they had TF30 P100s. Uh, that was already a pretty powerful airplane. It was I, I, if they had that? That was the engine of the F-111F, the TF-30 P-100. That was combined about, I want to say, for about fifty-eight thousand pounds of thrust and full reheat. Um, but I know I didn't hear about that plan. That the F-111G the Australians had was what the F-111 should have been all along. I think they had, you know, the uh, digital inertials, uh, FMS. Um, pave tack, powerful engines. Um, so no, I didn't hear about that. Um, moving on to John. I mean, he, John asked if that is another pretty uh, it's a question that's almost getting past uh, my expertise. He asked if there's good pressure recovery in the intakes into the engine. And that was something I never even thought about as a line pilot until I went to fighter weapons school. And one of the things we did, we with that same sortie where I talked about going, you know, up to high altitude, Mach 2.0. It's kind of an aircraft handling exercise. The start of that sortie was uh, taken off from Mountain Home and doing what was called the Runkowski, either Rum or Run, can't remember. Uh, Rum, I think it was Runkowski climb profile. And I can't remember the details of it because what it did at every moment of the climb was to, as the speed increased, was to maximize the air, uh, primarily reducing drag to the minimum. And so you would climb at, uh, it's like 550 knots, full burner, until reach 0.9 Mach, and then you'd unload the airplane to zero G to get through the Mach, and then you'd go out at like 1.2, or I can't, I can't, it's, it was, you know, it was a list of things you had to do. It was probably 15 steps long to get it right, to get you at, as far out, as far, cover as much distance and gain as much altitude in the least amount of time. And one of the elements of the Ronkowski profile, and I think the initial climb of about 550 knots, was that the airplane was encountering the air as fast as the engines were inhaling it. So there was no pumping loss and the engines uh, having to pull air into the intake and there was no drag. Basically, the drag of the nacelles went away because the engine was making the air just disappear. Uh, so that's that I think was what we called pressure recovery. Um, yeah, well, maybe not exactly pressure recovery, but that, there's one something we did that we paid attention to the pressure on the intakes in order to climb to max perform the airplane. Uh, Mark again says he, he hears the F model did achieve 3.2. I wouldn't doubt it. I know there was a, uh, I think I mentioned this before, there was a radar bomb scoring range up in Western Scotland on the coast that, that uh, an F model crew got in trouble for because they did a lot of damage. And that was low altitude. And they crossed the site at over Mach 1, and they weren't even an afterburner. Uh, there was no way. The F-111E that I flew, we'd get a totally tweaked engine. We'd get maybe to 0 .9, 0 0.91 on the deck. But without going to burner, we weren't going any faster than that. I, uh, Andrew Ford asks, um, if I ever interacted with the, RA, uh, with the Australian F-111s, oh, God, I wish I would have. Um, we did fly, uh, I think, at a red flag with Aussies. Um, the Aussies are just, I don't know what it is, or whether it's uh, because of their criminal background, that's a joke, or uh, um, being kind of out at one you know, remote corner of the world. The Aussies are just great people. I, I, uh, when I was on the MD-11 in Anchorage, I'd probably get down to Sydney, Australia, five, six times a year. And just the, the, the Aussies were just, just always the greatest people. So I know we would have had a, a great time. And, and they had sort of the similar uh, approach to things that the Brits did. And I did do an exchange with the Buccaneers. Uh, it, um, oh, gosh, I, the name escapes me now. But I did a month-long exchange. And those guys were, they were a blast to hang out with. But I, never had, I just never had that chance. 
Um, Brian W. asked, how long did it take to trust the terrain following radar? Um, and if I ever really trusted it. I, I, um, it's very difficult to explain this without pictures. The radar scope for the terrain following radar was a logarithmic, natural logarithmic display. And math people can, so it's like, I think it was, it went out, the range went out to 10 miles and halfway, the halfway point was five. And then three quarters of the way was, uh, anyway, the, the range wasn't linear. It's, it was logarithmic. It's like a logarithmic graph paper, if, you, if you're familiar with using that. And that made for a really kind of an abstract display. Uh, but the, the skill came in being able to see that abstract display and know exactly what it was telling you. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I know got some guys uh, flying during the day would work really hard. I was one of them. Uh, to be able to fly the airplane, I, I think 300 feet was about as close as I was willing to go. Uh, you know, if, if I wasn't getting shot at. So, uh, but to actually hand fly it and control my altitude just looking at the e scope. And you could do, it could be done. It was really, really hard. But if you could do that, then if you kept your eye on the e scope, then you knew what it was telling you and you trusted it. But there were some, there were some modes it could get into where it would, quite happily kill you. Um, if you, in fact, we lost a crew up in, uh, I think, the Isle of Skye, where the radars weren't properly tuned. The radar transmitters weren't tuned with it because there's two, two transmitters, two receivers. Uh, you only flew off of one, but they kind of air checked with each other. Anyway, they'd done some major maintenance in the airplane. And mixed up the the um, the transmitters and the receivers were paired because they operate on different frequencies. Otherwise, they jam each other. And so the maintenance people were supposed to make sure that the transmitter and uh, receiver were both tuned to the same freak. Well, something happened. They accidentally swapped the components or what I don't know. But this F one eleven F crew went out and uh, they were now low level over the Irish Sea. And when you're over water, the radar beam from the TFR will hit the water. And the water, unless it's really windy, unless it's pretty rough out there, the water acts like, to, to radio waves, acts like a mirror. And the, uh, so the radar wave will, hits at a very low angle, hits the surface of the water, just keeps on going. Never comes back to the radar receiver, so you never get any return over the water. The only, only thing stopping the airplane from hitting the water is uh, what we call the uh, low altitude radar altimeter. And it looked directly underneath the airplane. And if it wasn't getting a signal uh, from the TFR, the terrain following radar tra transmitter, then it would go into uh, LARA override and it would just look under the airplane and would go to the set clearance plane and that's where the altitude you'd fly. Well, the problem is, let's be, imagine if you're running along, looking down at your shoes as fast as you can go. And if there's an obstacle in the way, you're not going to see it until you hit it. And that's what happened to this crew. They, uh, they didn't see it because the radars weren't installed properly and the airplane never climbed over the island. And so they hit it and died. Um, there were other, some other modes where you could, uh, even over land, where snow could interact with uh, there were some other failure modes where the uh, the low altitude radar altimeter was supposed to take over and it didn't and then if there was no um, return from the TFRs the airplane could descend into whatever what is underneath it and so the I guess we never I never really trusted it uh, and I didn't really understand how much I didn't trust it until flying low altitude and desert storm 
where for the first time in my career, we were doing seriously low altitude stuff on in rugged terrain that I had never that nobody had ever checked out during the day that I'd never seen during the day. That was always a deal, flying TFR. You didn't ever flew a route at night you hadn't flown during the day. And here we are going into uh, now we're seriously low altitude. And uh, that was um, more stressful to me than getting shot at, if that, if that answers the question. Um, Miko, that's like, can I call you just Mickey Hackinen? That name I know. Um, the, uh, and I can pronounce it too. The USAF mothballed its last F-111s in the mid-90s. Um, Australia soldiered on to the 21st century. Uh, do I think there was any potential left in the aircraft for modifications and updates? Uh, no. Um, the uh, the F one elevens worked for the Australians because they had such a great need for a long range airplane that uh, if they had any uh, threat that was coming to them, it was going to it was if it was any like a naval threat. The F-111 was, you know, their, their air force is a primary response to that. And so they needed a, a really long-range airplane. That's why the F-111 lasted so long, I think, with the Australians. Um, the problem is that the airplane was fundamentally, well, okay, I know that that, that knucklehead, uh, oh, God, I can't talk and think at the same time. It was that U.S. Secretary of Defense who decided he was going to build an airplane and could do everything for everybody. Uh, McNamara. Uh, ultimately, it was able to do the low altitude, high speed thing very well. But that is a very confining role, and technology had changed so much from, geez, in Desert Storm, I think 80% of the weapons dropped were unguided. And then Nobody drops unguided weapons anymore. And if you're not dropping unguided weapons, you don't have to get nearly as close to your work. And if you don't have to get nearly so close to your work, then you don't have to spend nearly so much money on what's basically defensive performance. Uh, and, the, um, and so airplanes like the F-117, I mean, that was really an effective airplane. It was slow, it probably flew like, I never flew, I know guys who did. I don't think it flew particularly well, uh, but it because it didn't need defensive performance, it could be optimized to do what it, its real mission was. And the I think the F one eleven just it was designed in what nineteen sixty three. So by that's a thirty seven forty. That's a fifty year old airplane almost by the time. Now it wasn't the airplanes Australians had weren't fifty years old, but certainly the design was and. Uh, I think the only airplane that has, um, the only Lazarus airplane out there is the B-52. And that is because it is just an excellent bomb truck because it can go a long way, carry a hell of a lot of stuff, can be endlessly uh, modified with new electronics. And um, it, it's what it's, it doesn't because it doesn't need performance and it's not really it doesn't need defensive performance anymore and it was never really built with defensive performance in mind so it's not you're not spending any money on stuff you don't need anymore so i think the the 111 really was at the end of its life uh when it went um let's see john Ellis says the EF-111 did well with radar jamming and SAMs and Gulf War. Uh, it did. We had EF-111s up in um, um, Inzerlik, but they mostly went with the B-52s. And, and so the B-52s are more vulnerable than we were because at that time uh, you needed defensive performance because they were dropping unguided weapons. Or they needed defense of some kind because they had, they had to fly right over the target. Um, so the EFs primarily covered the B-52s. And we relied on our defensive performance and terrain masking 
uh, to defeat the enemy air defenses. And, and we flew from the north, and Saddam had focused most of his uh, SAMs down in the south. So we just didn't face the same threat that the uh, guys down south did. I think a guy I went through F-111 RTU with, he ended up going to F-16s. He got shot down using, I think he got shot down by an SA-3. Uh, he, he spent a month in, as a prisoner and then got released. Um, so those guys were getting a lot more missiles than we were. Uh, and also the F-16 was really not a very good airplane. Uh, in a lot of respects for that war because those guys are up at medium altitude and they were just they were just targets um, But they had SA sixes SA threes I think they had SA eights and a lot of triple-a up north the only thing we faced that I saw were SA twos and a, and And a lot of triple-a but the triple-a really wasn't effective and between the EF 111s shutting down their acquisition their search radars and the uh, weasels just schwacking their target acquisition radars. It was really, they're just firing blind. Um, John Ellis asked if I ever flew with the F, worked with the FRAF tornadoes. No, I didn't. They, they were down south during Desert Storm, and I don't think I ever really worked with them in any regard. Um, let's see. Uh, mirrored window asks, are there any novels I, that spoke to the realism of the role in the F-111? I know that, I think there are a couple out there. And, um, the, uh, but I've not read any. So I really don't know. I can't, I can't say anything about that. The tough thing, the really hard thing about flying is it's a very intense experience, <clears throat> but trying to explain it in a way that makes it interesting to a general reader, I would think would be, uh, that's certainly a challenge beyond any I could mount as a writer. Um, uh, Dirk, Dirk Diggler says, actually I cover this thing, is there a cough switch in this microphone? Let me hold this so you can. <coughs> <clears throat> Hope nobody heard me, heard that. Um, our aunt, uh, Dirk Diggler says Immelman, and that's in response to my saying Shondell and Dirk Diggler, full points. And the Immelman is exactly what I was talking about. Um, we'd start out about 500 knots, and by the time we got to the top, we would be doing about 280 or so. And uh, then you could unload the airplane and the wings, we'd be sweeping the wings forward about 26. And uh, it was a big Immelman. Not like a F-16 would do. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, Yuha Pentile, um, I know I mangled that, asked how fast the F-15 could go low level, or the F-11 go low level, and what was the minimum altitude with terrain following radar? The uh, airplane would top out about Mach 1.2, and that would, the ground speed would vary based on temperature. On a really cold day, that Mach 1.2 would happen more slowly because sound travels faster or slower through cold air. So uh, a warm day, Mach 1.2 is faster than a cold day. Um, the F-11, a and E, if there was ordnance on board the airplane, even if it was Mark 84s, the ordnance would have enough. Um, and when I say Mark 84, I need to step back a bit. That's a, uh, that's a weapon, 2,000 pound weapon that mounts directly to the pylon. And it is a very, very clean load. We can only carry four of them, but the load was so clean that it almost was like you weren't flying with ordnance on board. But anything else that any other ordinance we carried would we'd have to have either two 
depending on the half we're carrying eight, no, let's see, a two, four, six. if we were carrying 12, we could carry 12 Mark 82s, six on a rack on each side, one of our combat loads. Well, anyway, I won't get into that stuff, but if you start carrying Mark 82s or CBUs, they, those loads start getting pretty draggy. And we just, we would really, if in a combat, if the air, engines were trimmed for combat instead of life, we could get about 530 knots with the weapons on board. And then once you got rid of them, that'd be 100 knots faster. Uh, the F-111F, it could go right up to the barber pole. Uh, that, that airplane was, without a doubt, the fastest airplane in the world at low altitude and probably, so far as I know, perhaps aside from MiG-25 and the SR-71, also the fastest airplane at high altitude. Uh, the SR-71, I think, does about Mach 4.5. And, and I know the F-111 go over Mach 3. I don't think any of F-15, F-22, I think those are Mach 2.3 airplanes, uh, if memory serves. So uh, nobody could touch us down low, uh, even... Uh, and I think the, uh, there's an F-111 squadron that wanted to set a low altitude speed record um, before they retired it. And the Air Force decided we didn't need to be glorifying the F-111 at that point, so they wouldn't let them do it. But it would have it taken it for sure. The uh, minimum altitude with terrain falling radar, 200 feet. And we had uh, four set clearance planes, five. 200, 300, 400, 500, 750 and a thousand, make that six. So I think we have six set clearance planes. Uh, 200 was as low it would go, and it would do it. Uh, most of the airplanes would actually do it pretty, they'd hold to that level pretty tightly. Um, and uh, if, if we set it to hard ride, it would, it would, it would, uh, Get close enough to an obstacle in front to require a 4G pull to clear it, and it would use zero Gs over the top. So a hard ride was, was definitely a show. And at night, that would really get your attention. Um, during the day, we, depending on the rules, we could fly it about as low as you could stand it. Um, the hand flying, and you could the airplane was really great on the deck, hand flying. It was uh, because of the high wing loading, it was extremely stable, and uh, and so it was just really easy to point it where you wanted it and and have it do what you wanted to. So we we I think we had to get through fighter weapons school. We had to be able to uh, do a level turn at a hundred feet and not gain any altitude. Like a level ninety degree turn at one hundred feet and roll and be at one hundred feet throughout the whole thing. Uh, John Ellis, yes, you did hear correctly. Uh, I got to nine thirty um, at red flag, but that was on a warm day, clean airplane, and a tailwind. So I was that was a ground speed readout, uh, but that was like seriously fast. Um, I did see the, uh, Dirk asks, did I ever see the video about, uh, with an RAAF F-111 used a hook to land without the undercarriage? I did, and that's not the only time that's happened. I think that's happened two or three other times. Uh, one time it happened at uh, Lake and Heath, a little bit of a story here. Um, I don't think we operated nearly as just overall, I, I, if I were to make a criticism of the institutional Air Force when I was in it, we just didn't operate as smartly as we could. I won't go into details about that, but there were just some things we did. If you step back, you go, ah, that didn't make any sense. And so it was a F-111F that um, the mains wouldn't come down, or the main, I should say. And so they arranged to foam the runway. And the idea was that the 111 would the foam would start at the cable and go down the runway for a thousand feet and the 111 would aim to snag the cable and then then slide out of the foam and 
if you do it right, the airplane really doesn't get damaged very much. Again, it's probably in, back in service within a week or two. They pull, they pull sheet metal from underneath the airplane, replace the strakes, you know, put in some new panels, and it's you know, Bob's your uncle. You're back in the air. Uh, what happened though was some bad coordination. Lake and Heath had two sets of cables. And the, uh, I think this was at night too, which didn't help. Anyway, the fire department phoned from the second cable and the 111 missed the first cable, advanced power to go around and on the go around caught the second cable and just slammed the thing into the pavement. Nobody was hurt, but it, it uh, didn't do the airplane any favors. But yeah, it's happened a few times. Um, Jason thinks it would have been cool for an upgraded 111. It, they started doing upgrades when I was in it. They, uh, the flight control computers became, we had a couple airplanes show up just before they closed out. Like the, we had one that came down in the closing stages of Desert Storm that had digital flight control computers, GPS, ring laser gyros, McDo. It didn't have a, a, an FMS in the sense that we think of it nowadays. But the airplane was just, they got rid of a lot of the analog stuff. And suddenly the airplane just got super reliable. And they put them in the boneyard. Um, so I don't, I think that the, uh, it could be like a Super Hornet. It could be an airplane like the Super Hornet or the B-52 or uh, an airplane that could, uh, with its speed and range, especially with its speed, you get some speed, you get some, uh, you start getting some standoff range. If you launch a, a weapon at, at 600 knots, that airplane's gonna have a lot more, and especially up at altitude, that airplane's gonna have a lot, uh, weapon's gonna have a lot more uh, kinematic range than a B-52 who's launching it at, you know, 200 knots slower. But the, just the infrastructure of the airplane, and the variable wing sweep, which really, you, that's the big thing. It was, we, we, that was treated as necessary for the low altitude environment and the cold, low altitude Cold War environment to get the speed and the range you needed. Well, if you don't need a, a variable geometry wing anymore, because the defensive protection, the defensive performance just isn't necessary, then suddenly that just, you just strike the 111 off the page because the, uh, the maintenance effort in that was huge. Um, and there's a, the reason for that is, and I don't think I've talked about this before, in a conventional airplane, there are probably two, three spars that go through the fuselage, that carry the loads, that transmit the loads and the wings to the fuselage. So the, uh, there's a lot of structure that... Translate that transmit the lifting loads to the fuselage. Well, the F 111, the wings pivot on a pin. The every ounce of the aerodynamic loads on the wings gets transmitted through that pin. Now, it's a pin that's probably uh, about this big around, probably four five inches, six inches across, which is like, you know, I don't know, 50, 30 centimeters in, in, old, in new money. Uh, and it was a, so it's a big pin, pretty like, like about this size. I think the wing carry through structure was where the wing inserted was probably about this high where the wing mated with it. So you have a pin that's about that big. I think they froze it to put it in nitrogen to shrink it, to fit it in the wing, and then, you know, through the, the uh, bearing on the wing itself. And all the load got transmitted through that. And if you ever take a look at a picture of 111, there's a pretty neat, the, the Aussies had the airplane long enough for digital photography to show up. And you'll see if there's an airplane turning hard, you'll see that there's a structure on the top of the fuselage that is actually lifted up from the top of the fuselage because the wing's bending. And that actually that top part of the top of the fuselage isn't fixed. It's, it's attached, I don't know how the heck they attach that thing with cables and springs or whatever, but it actually had to move 
to accommodate the bending of the wing at high G loads. Anyway, back in the day that uh, we lost in 111s when the wings came off. And they discovered that the wing carry through structure was fracturing. And so they made some improvements to the wing carry through structure, changed the steel. Uh, and then the other thing they did was they, they created a giant uh, freezer. They stripped the airplane down. When, when this was always at uh, major, like major level depot maintenance, where they practically rebuild the airplane around the around the left throttle. Um, and they put they roll the airplane in this freezer, take it down to minus thirty C. So you know, if you're taking a structure that big down to that temperature, and what they were doing was they want to find out if the metal had gotten brittle. And that it was reaching a fatigue failure point. And then they they put the uh, airframe on, basically strap it down. And then they had jacks out at the wingtips that flexed the wing to the minus 2.5 plus 7.33 G limits. And they did that to see if they could break a wing off. And they had microphones and stuff listening to the carry-through structure to see if they could hear any uh, any sound of fatigue cracks opening and closing. But every time an airplane went into major depot maintenance, it was a huge freaking production to make sure that the wings were going to stay on till the next time they had, you know, major depot. And that is a giant expense. And it's not an expense that adds to the survivability of the airplane in a new environment. So it really was time to get rid of it because it, it just wasn't what we needed anymore. Um, Okay, Jeff, just before like we carry on, are you happy to go till about quarter past eight hour time, quarter past nine yours? Yeah, so we can yeah, get a few I, more I questions in. Do that. And uh, when, you, when your people start losing, uh, when your, your audience starts losing consciousness, just tell me. <laughs> I don't think that's happening. I just wanted to get as many <laughs> as you can. So, yeah, we'll go to quarter past um, eight UK time, guys. So, yeah, Jeff, just carry on when you're, okay, when you're I'll ready. Try what I'm going to do is, is try to be a little less windy. So uh, I'll see if I can make that. Uh, I'll make that my my resolution for the next uh, twenty minutes. Less wind. Um, <laughs> Perfect. I uh, Connor Du Duchet asks if I knew any pilots in combat lancer. I'm sure I did. Um, I got into the F one eleven in nineteen seventy eight, and I'm sure the so that was the. Vietnam War had been over by, what, six years by that point. So I'm certain that the, the majors and lieutenant colonels in the squadron were Vietnam vets. But, you know, I don't, it wasn't something that, as a butter bar, as a newbie, I wasn't just going to, like, go up and, and ask questions. And, I, you know, something guys didn't talk about much. But I knew, I know there were guys. We had some guys that, uh, I think are, anyway, I know there were guys who were in Vietnam, but uh, it was never anything I talked about much at the time. How large was the combat load? Um, it depended on what we were. Chuck Meister is asking this, by the way. He's asking how large is the combat load of the F-111 and how fast could we go with it? Um, it depended. We, our primary weapons at the time were the Mark 84, 2,000 pound weapon with a parachute retarder on it. Uh, so that we carry four of those directly mounted to the pivoting, pivoting wing pylons. And that was an extremely maneuverable, extremely slick load. But often wasn't really the best for the target because, because we didn't have uh, precision guidance, then we often had to make up with, our, well, with less accuracy by having more weapons. And so for... The other uh, load we carried a lot was uh, 12 Mark 82s. That'd be, let's see, yeah, six on a side. Uh, let's see, I think three. Yeah, I think it was six on a side, uh, mounted on pylons one and four, which is the leftmost and the rightmost. Um, and then we did that to reduce interference drag between the weapons and the fuselage. 
Uh, low altitude, that was pretty good. And that wasn't too draggy. That would, you, you knew that was on board. That would probably take 30 knots off the top end. And so instead of doing 530 to, you know, 550 with the Mark 84s, we're probably down to 530 or 520 with the Mark 82s. And this is in cold power. Um, then the other weapon we carried a lot, we use this against uh, EWGCI sites where there was a lot of uh, soft skin targets. Um, you know, use it, they would carry eight, eight CBU 5871. I hope people, if there's any, I, I, as a fighter weapons school grad, I'm embarrassed that I don't remember the exact numbers of this because what I see in my brain is 12. Well, my, the other part of my brain says six, but I think it's probably 12. I think it carried 12 CBU 5871, and those were really draggy. And that really compromised our performance. We'd be down at uh, below 500 knots with those. But they, had a, they were great for area targets, uh, area soft targets. They were really the thing to have. Towards the end of the war, I got approval to carry 14 uh, Mark 82s uh, just because we, we were by that time going down to Altaji, which is their uh, big Air Force base north end of uh, – north of Baghdad, and we were up at medium altitude at that point in the low 20s. And uh, so we called that waffle bombing. We, just, we were just going out there and trying to make Altaji look like a waffle, and that meant more weapons better. And so we carried uh, six on each pylon, and uh, on the pylons one and four, and then one each directly mounted to the pylons at uh, two and three. But that is up at medium altitude. We're doing about 0.75 Mach, about 450 knots ground. And that's, uh, but the things you see, if you see pictures of the 111, like at an air show with all that stuff loaded out in front of it, or, you know, it could carry 24 Mark 82s. Probably wasn't going to go above 10,000 feet. Probably wouldn't go faster than 300 knots. Uh, you never do that in combat. Um, Vlee Horse Range, Eric DeJong. Man, that, that's a name. Holy cow. Yeah, we, we used to, I, in fact, I was uh, flying over, I think I was flying to Stansted from Liège a few nights ago. And we, since that's a short leg, we're only about 18,000 feet. And, and uh, I looked down and I knew, okay, one of those, I think it's that island there. That's the, what's the name of that thing? Ah, yes. You just told me. Blee Horse. Yeah, we used to, I've probably been there 50 times. Uh, that was a pretty cool range. I really like the pop pattern there. Um, jackpot. I didn't. I think I only went to jackpot once or twice, but I went to Vlee Horse a lot. Um, let's see. How many combat missions that I flew uh, during the Gulf War? Well, I was. I flew thirteen. Um. I think the highest crew had 23 or 25. Um, the reason I flew 13 was, um, and it, with only 15 minutes to go, I could easily spend a half hour talking about this, is that the mission planning practices we had for peacetime did not and, uh, and remember, I mentioned earlier, we really didn't do things as smart as we should have done. And uh, they didn't, weren't really suited to combat. And so the first, I flew on, my first mission was night two of the war. Uh, because I, I was the highest time pilot in the squadron. I was a fighter weapons school grad. So they kind of, and had been to Red Flag and all that other stuff. So they're kind of looking at me to, so I was the lead mission planner for night one and then i led a four ship uh on night two but the first couple nights the the planning was just so chaotic that uh that after i came back from the second mission the squadron commander said you know, he told me jeff i hate to tell you this but you're done you're grounded until this gets fixed and so uh he put it up to me to get our processes in place so we could get things done reliably and correctly and accurately and efficiently and all that stuff. And it took me, 
I think it was about 10, <clears throat> excuse me, about 10, uh, about 10 days before we finally had the uh, process down to a point where I could go back to the cockpit again. And by that time, I'd caught pneumonia from working 20-hour days. And then they sent me on a round turkey trip to explain Air Force operations to the Turkish Air Force. And then I got back, and I, and the, and I, and I think the, uh, the flight doc saw murder in my eyes, and he put me back on flying status, even though I still had pneumonia. Anyway, so that's how I got to 13 instead of 25. Um, the typical payload in the early part, I think uh, I carried mostly CBU 5871 because we were going after uh, GCI sites at that point, and they're kind of soft skin. And uh, then after that, it was almost all Mark 82s, the 500 pounder. Uh, Mika Hakkinen, sorry, but that's who you are now, uh, asks, uh, how big of a game changer was for the 111 when the Soviets started introducing fighters with the uh, Pulse Doppler radars? Um, that was really huge. The, when I first got in the airplane in the late 70s, nobody could see us down low. So we were, we were basically immune. And by the time the late 80s came, well, the F-15 started coming into the inventory. I think the very first F-15s came in the inventory about 78 or 79. And by the time there was a fair number of them, we couldn't, we really had a tough time at, at, uh, at red flag. Uh, we didn't do night red flags so that didn't glorify area enough, but it was, they could find us. Uh, they have a hard time shooting things at us because I don't think the missiles were as good. Their radar missiles couldn't, clutter reject nearly as well as their uh, as the airplane's radars could. So they had to, they had to use, uh, well, guns were out of the question because they just couldn't get that close enough. And most of the time, if we could see them, we could stagnate them at the uh, limit of, of uh, their air, uh, heat-seeking missiles. But into the 90s, the radar, radar missiles were getting, uh, they were guiding themselves, they were getting a clutter rejection, and that was another reason why uh, the F-111 really had reached its limit because its uh, defensive performance just wasn't suitable for the threat anymore. Um, John says the wing box of the prototype F-14 is made of titanium. I don't know. I can't remember what the wing box in the F-111 was made of. I think it was a special kind of aluminum. I don't think it was titanium, but but um, uh, really, I, I'd, I'd have to plead ignorance on that one. Um, Chuck Meister asks, are swept wing aircraft redundant today? I, I think what you mean by, if you mean by that variable sweep, uh, variable geometry uh, aircraft, yes. Um, the, the F-111 achieved its speed by drag reduction rather than engine power. And modern engines are so much more powerful than, I, I don't know what an F-15, F-15 engine is probably, what, 40,000 pounds a side or something, or something ridiculous like that. Uh, F-22 is probably more than that. Uh, they're so much more powerful that they don't have to, um, they don't have to go to all these extreme measures to control drag in order to get the speed they want. I think the, uh, the uh, F-22 op spec was to super cruise, to be able to cruise supersonic, I'm thinking 1.3 or so, 1.5, was to be able to cruise supersonic at altitude and cold power. And that is, you know, it's basically using, uh, with more efficient engines with, with digital flight control, a uh, digital uh, full authority digital engine controls, FADEX. The engines are so much more reliable and they're so much more efficient and so much more powerful that they can get to the speed that they need to get to employ the airplane without having to go to all the really, really expensive and complex stuff that variable geometry uh, wings require. I mean, if you look at the flaps and slats on a, on a F-111, those are like you put on airliners except they have to be able to put up with 7G turns. And 
And the other huge drawback that variable geometry wings have is that uh, you, they have to, if they're sweeping aft, they have to sweep into the fuselage. And if they sweep into the fuselage, they can't be very, they can't have ever very long cord because fuselages aren't that wide in a fighter. And so what you end up forced, forced into with, with a variable geometry wing, and the tornado is no different than the F-111, is the wings are narrow. And therefore, the wing loading is very high. And then induced drag skyrockets when you load up the airplane. And there are some other unfavorable things that happen with a, a heavily wing loaded airplane, uh, particularly uh, in the region of the backside of the power curve, which in a airplane like the F-111 was nearly vertical. And that makes an airplane really attention getting if you get it wrong. Uh, let's see. I, uh, again, asked if I, uh, I don't know that much on the FB-111 conversion, the F-111G. Uh, so I'd have to claim uh, ignorance on that one without shame, I hope. Uh, Let's see. I'm not sure. Paul asks what Paul Baird asks what I think of the red buccaneer. I, I guess I'm not I, the buccaneer. I, I'm, if I'm thinking of the airplane, um, I thought the buccaneer was pretty cool, but I'm not sure what you mean by a red buccaneer. Oh, RAF, RAF. Never mind. Read the next line. Open your eyes. There it is. the The buccaneer was pretty similar to the A6 in terms of performance. Um. Uh, the, the Buccaneer pilots, and I, I told the story last time about how they spoofed some F-15s big time over the North, North Sea where we were the, uh, they were the very shiny thing because they flew so close to the water, they left awake and the F-15s toggled in on the shiny thing. And then, and then we shot them with, uh, with AIM-9 Papas. Uh, anyway, the, the Buck was a older airplane. I think it was probably designed late 50s, so I think seven years older or so than the 111. Uh, it was slower uh, and didn't carry as much payload and just didn't have the performance. But but the the RAF pilots got every single ounce that thing that airplane had. And I worked with them for a month. I was, oh, what's the Dutch air base where they were at? Dirk Diggler is probably going to tell me what it is in a second now. Uh, I think it was Dirk that told me before. Um, Anyway, I was at, uh, did a little bit of a squadron exchange with them for a month, and just great guys and great working with them. Uh, Dirk asked, is there a reason other than the show element to light up uh, to do what we call the torch? Uh, I wish. It, I, I, get, I, won't, I have like one picture in my collection. I have one of pictures with a torch. Because the airplane, I mean, it's like there's a million of them. The airplane was... It's like, yeah, it's all very bright and shiny and yeah, but it's, it's bollocks. The, uh, the reason that we had, uh, that we had a, the fuel dump, uh, a, a capacity to dump fuel is that if we, especially in the early versions of the F-111, if you pop the motor, then you're kind of thrust limited and you did not want to be carrying a whole lot of extra fuel. And then also because of the variable geometry wing and its complexity in the flaps and slats, uh, we had a pretty, uh, a very non, uh, reasonably significant rate of uh, flap slat failures. And even a light airplane, uh, you could be coming over the fence at 200, 210 knots, which is very close to the, to the limiting, the, the rotational speed limit of the tires. And so we had the dump capability there exclusively to lighten the airplane uh, so we could get around thrust limited or lift limited situations. It just so happens the design of the airplane where the main, the main fuel was in the uh, aft and, and uh, forward tanks and the fuselage, the only way to dump it was to put it out between the center, between the two engines. And if you have afterburners, well, how long do you think it's going to take before guys figure out how that works? So, uh, the, but that it was the reason it was there was for gross weight management and emergency. Uh, and it, then it was just like, oh, cool, you know, it's like our air show trick, torching. Um, 
John is correcting me on the F-15 thrust. I don't, I think I said 40, 30, but John says 30. He's right. And 32 for uh, F-119. So I think I was exaggerating on that. You know, it's funny um, how much thrust airline engines produce. I think I fly 757. Oh, wait, let, me, let me get this straight. I'll, I'll back up a little bit. The MD-11 I flew. I, I, so we don't memorize thrust numbers in the airline business. It's, it doesn't really make any difference. But the, the MD-11 at full grunt with, without uh, temperature reduced takeoff, 60,000 pounds per engine. That's almost twice as much as an F-119 has. And MD-11 engines aren't as powerful as triple. I think triple seven engines are up around the 80,000 pound region. And uh, the reason they have so much thrust is because of the way the, the fans on the front of the engine move so much mass, so much air mass through the engine in a way that the uh, fuselage requirements of a, of a fighter, you just can't get a really high bypass ratio engine, but it's really, it's interesting that airliners have way more thrust than, uh, than fighters do. Uh, Dojo says, uh, uh, was told the F-1 was speed limited by skin temp, not engine thrust. Well, all airplanes are fundamentally speed limited by thrust because the airplane's going to accelerate. If you say, give it full power, it's going to accelerate until the drag equals a thrust, and then it won't accelerate anymore. So at some point, you get going fast enough so that the drag of the airplane would match the thrust of the engine. Uh, and that drag's pretty significant. If you're at full afterburner in the F-111E, which had 36, so the 1.2 Mach, that had about 36,000 pounds of drag on the airplane. Um, uh, the skin temp was an issue if you're going fast enough, long enough. Down at low altitude, we think we burned 40,000 pounds an hour at full grunt. We took off with 50, 30, let's see, 30,000 pounds of gas, I think was our 32, maybe uh, 32,000 pounds of gas without tanks. So you're not, you're not going full grunt for more than about five or six minutes before you just don't have enough gas to get back home. And the airplane won't get that hot at low altitude that fast. I think it could potentially, I think it could have been a problem up at high altitude because we, uh, the uh, engines burned so much less gas up there uh, and we went faster. Uh, but that was just simply a role we never, it, it uh, never played. John mentions the F-14 uh, would spin. I don't, I, I, I don't know. I think, I know the F-111 would spin very happily. It would just never recover. Uh, the, the, recovery, the recovery maneuver for an F-111 spin was ejection, handle, squeeze, and pull. I don't know for the F-14 if it, they can spin it and recover it. I really don't know. But so far as I know, uh, fighters, because of the way the mass is distributed. Uh, the mass is the F-111. Our fighters tend to have a pretty high polar moment of inertia. If that makes sense. And once you get the airplane rotating like that, it it is very difficult. Especially if you've gotten slow and into a spin in the first place. Uh, it is frequently the case where there's just not enough aerodynamic force that the uh, the uh, ailerons and the elevator can can exert to overcome that rotational inertia um let's see i think we're almost uh, done now jeff Eric the Jones, he sets me straight that's the second time you've set me straight vlee horse and now schusterberg schusterberg was a place man i must I, I'm losing it. I'm losing it, man. Yeah, thank you very much for setting me straight on that. And I think Mike is getting ready to pull out the hook that hauls me off stage. Uh, I hope um, that my answers weren't too windy or dull or inaccurate. I guess I'd rather be windy and dull than, than uh, full of bollocks. 
<laughs> but uh, anyway, it was great fun coming back and uh, great uh, talking to you guys and uh, channeling one of my heroes. On that bombshell, we'll say good night. Okay, well, Jeff, I want to thank you very much for coming on. It's always a pleasure having you on the channel and answering our viewers' questions. And there were some great ones today, guys. And yeah, it seems like you all enjoyed it. We had a good uh, turnout. And um, so, yeah, I just want to thank you again, Jeff.